anyway. Um, but I, I find them cumbersome compared to a table. Which, now, that's not generally true for me. I'm a, I'm a picture kind of guy. I like diagrams, and you'll see in the next um, webinar, which will be the, the state-based one, or in one of the subsequent webinars on state-based testing, you'll see me using a diagram. I'm perfectly happy. So I'm, I'm typically more pleased with a picture than with a, uh, than with a table of data. But this is one of these cases where I simply find the table a lot more clear than the cause-effect graph of the picture. But anyway, um, the cause-effect graph, there's always an equivalent cause-effect graph for a decision table. You can convert from one to another. And uh, so if you, if for whatever reason, when you get your requirements specification, your whatever the business analysts or requirements engineers give you, and it happens to include a cause-effect graph in it, and you're going, well, what do I do with this? Um, you can convert the cause-effect graph into a table and um, then use that uh, under the technique that I described before for a generation of test cases, um, either literally generating concrete test cases from the table or using the table itself as a logical test case. Now, the conversion is... Um, in, involves taking a uh, uh, taking the graph and um, you're going to take the conditions out of the graph. You're going to put it on the top left uh, side of the decision table. Take the uh, actions off of the graph uh, and put those on the bottom left of the decision table. You then generate all possible combinations of conditions, and, and you already saw how to do that with the full table. And then by reading the cause-effect graph, you can determine on an action-by-action -action basis uh, which columns result in, a, in, in each action being taken or not. And so you're basically going to read off the, the graph, and um, that's going to generate the bottom half of the, of the table. The top half of the table, remember, is generated automatically through the pattern of Boolean uh, or other conditional values at the top. Uh, and then once you're done generating the table, it's a full table, so if you want to collapse it, you can collapse it using the technique that I explained to you. Um, now, let me, th this probably does not make a whole lot of sense at this point because if you haven't seen a cause-effect graph, so let me show you cause-effect graph. Now, this is, this cause-effect graph is um, equivalent to the table that I showed you uh, in previous slides. So the way that these work is that you've got, as I said, uh, you've got your conditions on the left-hand side over here. See, there they are. Real account, active account, within limit, location, OK. And then we have actions on the right-hand side, as you see over here. Okay. And we also have um, an intermediate condition in here, which I will explain in just a minute. And what happens is we use uh, logical operators, four logical operators, to connect the conditions uh, with the actions um, to be either taken or not taken. So for example, we'll look at the first one. Real account, active accounts, within limit, location OK. If all four of those things are true, we will approve the transaction. And you can see that, by the way, over here, this is column one in the decision table, right? All four of those things are true, we approve. OK, so that's shown here because what we've got We've got the logical operator A causes B, that's here. And we've combined that with the AND logical operator, which is shown here, where, where A1 and A2 both have to be true for B to be true. You notice you've got this little carrot shape above the, this, uh, next to this arc. So the upward pointing carrot shape that looks kind of like letter A is, is the AND operator. So real account and active account and within limit and location OK caused approved to occur. That's what this reading this no, notation here. So that's a combination of the A causes B operator with the AND operator. Okay. So this is how those um, those four interact to result in a uh, approval. Now, we also have a not A causes B. So in other words, A has to be false for B to happen. A causes B means A has to be true for B to happen. And we see that here. If the account is not real, 
or the account is not active. Those are not real. Or the account is not active. Call the vendor. I right? now see the or operator. This is the thing that's upside the upside down here. It looks kind of like a V. So if it looks like an A, it's an and, and if it looks like a V, it's an or. Okay, so if it's not a real account, it's not an active account, or, excuse me, not a real account or not an active account, call the vendor. And um, then we have the call card holder. Um, and basically, um, it has to be a real account, otherwise there's no card, card holder to a call. And then there are two other things um, that one or the other has to be not true. It either has to be going over the limit, Okay, so it's not within limit, or it has to be in a bad location. So it's not in an OK location. So if either the limit or the location is bad, which I've formed here as this intermediate condition, okay, if limit or location is bad and it's a real account, call the cardholder. Okay, so some of you are probably looking at that and saying, oh, I love that. That's the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. That's really cool. And others of you are probably saying, wow, uh, gee, I'm how that works, but I don't like it. Some of you might be saying, well, I still don't see exactly how that works. Um, that, that's OK. If you, th these, th you're, you're less likely to run into these than just a standard um, decision table. So I, I don't, don't get too stressed out if you're looking at this and saying, oh, my god, I was doing fine on this webinar all the way up until here, and now I got lost, and I'll never be able to use decision tables. Uh, you can live without these if you, if, uh, if you have to. Uh, or if you want to. Now, uh, given a uh, table, if, if you do like these, if you do think these things are really cool and you just can't live without them in your life, um, you want to be able to create them from the table, well, it's, it's easy enough. You take the conditions, you put them on the left-hand side of a blank piece of paper uh, or blank Visio <laughs> sheet if you're using Visio. And then you list all the actions on the right-hand side. So the conditions are on the top left of the decision table, and they're on the and the actions are on the uh, bottom left. And so you're basically just grabbing them and putting them on opposite sides of a piece of paper. And then what you're going to do is you're going to go action by action. You're going to read the top of the table, and you're going to look at how the combinations of actions, excuse me, the combination of conditions, to cause or don't cause the actions. And you use those Boolean operators that I showed you to make the connections and um, repeat that for all the actions, and you know, then you're done. Now, uh, I'm sure there is some sort of fancy technique for doing this with non-Boolean conditions, um, but I'm not sure exactly what it is, and I've never taken the trouble to learn it. Um, so there's probably some extension of this is required, or you have to convert the um, conditions into Boolean conditions or something like that, um, all of which sounds like a lot of work. So as I said, I don't tend to use these. And, and I think they're, they're interesting, but not necessarily as useful decision tables. But if you do like this idea, um, you, you'll probably want to look into a little further how to create the um, um, graph based on a um, decision table that includes both Boolean and non-Boolean conditions. OK, but anyway, that's, that's enough on the cause-effect graphs for the moment. Uh, let's move on. I, I promised a discussion about equivalence partitioning and, uh, with respect to decision tables. And so let's take an example here. If we look at column 9 in the collapse table, where it says, okay, if it's not a real account, um, you know, do a certain set of things. It you know, doesn't matter whether it's active or within limit or whatever. Um, <coughs> So we can equivalence partition the condition of not a real account. And we could say, well, let's see. Now, um, you look at a credit card. You get a card number. You get the card holder. You've got the expiration date. And you've got the card security code, that three or four digit code that's on there. And if any uh, mismatches occur amongst those uh, four different values, um, then uh, that would that would result in a uh, uh, the card being you know, the account being not real. Um, so um, we can say that uh, there are three uh, sort of fundamental equivalence partitions for the not real account. They do not involve combinations. That's the 